Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Judy Pino, Communications Director for the New Civil Liberties Alliance. Thank you for joining us. So in a landmark win for charter boat fishermen across the Gulf of Mexico, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit has set aside a controversial fin final rule issued by the National Marine Fisheries Services. And it, require, it required 24-hour GPS tracking of recreational charter boat fishing vessels and reporting of confidential economic data. The ruling, uh, the ruling is major for many reasons, and we're going to discuss that today, as well as how it could impact Loper Bright Enterprises v. Gina Raimondo, which is a similar case currently pending before the U.S. Supreme Court. And so I'd like to introduce you now to Captain Alan Wahlberg, our client of AMB Charters in Naples, Florida, NCLA Senior Litigation Counsel John Vecchioni, and Local Counsel Greg Grimsall and Kate Clark of Gordon Arata Montgomery Barnett. And they will be making some opening statements and provide analysis on the impact of this ruling. Uh, without further ado, we'll start with John, uh, then Alan, then uh, Greg and Kate. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you all for being here. Um, the Mexican Gulf uh, versus commerce uh, is important for the charter boat captains who are licensed to fish in the Gulf of Mexico or bring people out to fish, I should say, uh, because they were gonna be tracked by a. GPS device. It's called a VMS device in a regulation, but that's just because the bureaucrats always have to have a different word for things. But you you out there would know something as GPS. Um, and they were going to be tracked whether they were fishing or not fishing, whether they were going to get gas, whether they were going to take someone to dinner, um, whether they were sightseeing. And uh, many people uh, who were affected by this made comments to NOAA. They made comments when the to National Marine Fisheries when the regulation came out and said, hey, we're going to be tracked. We're going to be followed around. This is a, this violates our, our privacy. And the, the government, the agencies didn't respond. And one of the reasons this case is important is, number one, says that the, the agencies have to respond to comments and the agency should know what the Constitution says. They, they uh, the defense for the agencies in this case was that, um, hey, we didn't know that meant Fourth Amendment violations. And the uh, the Fifth Circuit said that borders on the incredible. Um, so I think that going forward, the fact that when you when lay people who aren't lawyers complain about uh, being followed around, that the government who operates under the Constitution should know what it says. And then there's also this Fourth Amendment issue. The court didn't directly reach it, but they said, we think it's a probable violation to follow people all around all the time just because they're a regulated party. And finally, I, I think the most important thing uh, for going forward for every industry is the Fifth Circuit basically said that there'll be snowball fights in Baton Rouge before they're going to say that the uh, exception for a closely regulated uh, industry who don't get all the Fourth Amendment protections you normally have, that they're going to extend that to any more industries. And then the final thing I'd like to say is how this affects the wider, uh, almost every agency and every court decision, which is in this case, the um, Fifth Circuit was clear that costs matter, that when the agencies look at something, they have got to count costs. And one of those costs is constitutional violations. That is, I don't believe, been as clearly stated as, as it was stated in Mexican Gulf before. I think the law has been pushing that way, but it's very clear here. And finally, uh, and we'll discuss more about this, is the Chevron issue. This is the issue where you defer to a, an administrative agency on what the statute allows it to regulate unless it is patently unreasonable interpretation, and the courts have to follow that. Well, there's another case against uh, the, the same agencies um, saying that, hey, we shouldn't use Chevron at all. It's going to the Supreme Court. It's called Loper Bright. Well, the Fifth Circuit here says, wait a second, you don't even get there because the statute doesn't say they can do this at all. It's silent on this issue. And since it's silent, silent doesn't give you ambiguity, does not give the administrative agencies uh, a chance to get this type of deference. So for all those reasons, I think it's an important case. I think it'll be cited to the Supreme Court in this upcoming uh, Loper Bright decision. And I'll pass it on. Uh, Alan, you're you're not you're not an attorney, but you're living this. What what um, what do you think? I'm getting close. I'm practicing at the dock these days, John. <laughs> um, just 
just to expand a little bit on what John said as far as the uh, mandatory requirements of the vessel monitoring system or VMS system that NOAA mandated for us is it was a collection gathering device that we were already providing the same information via paper logbooks. But what made it so egregious for me is the fact that NOAA mandated that I purchased, that all charter boat captains have to purchase these vessel monitoring systems at a cost of anywhere from $500 to $3,000 a piece and pay a vessel monitoring system that was going to be around $75 a month in perpetuity as long as we maintained our fishing licenses. That's quite expensive, in my estimation, for a government agency to propel the public to buy these devices and pay for this tracking information so that they can gather data that we were already providing for them for free of the paper logbook. So I was pretty kicked off since at the time I owned four charter boats and you can do the math as to how much it would cost me personally each month to, to provide this data. So I did a little research online and <clears throat> came across John and his, one of his cases defending fishermen up in the Northeast. I contacted him and kind of told him what was going on. And he said he'd talk to his higher ups and they'd, they'd get back to me. Um, one other thing that um, I wanted to make mention about is <clears throat> once they mandated us to buy these devices, they were our own personal devices. I mean, we, we purchased them, installed them on our boats, but yet they were able to go in and download our information off of our boats, telling, telling them exactly where we're fishing. Now, anybody that knows anything about fishing knows fishermen like to hide their fishing spots from everybody else. But this information, even though Noah said it would be closely held, was not closely held. It was public knowledge via several law enforcement agencies that were outside of Noah's purview they were able to log into this device gathering system and get that information. And some of the some of the law enforcement officers were laughing at me about fishing my fishing spots out in the Gulf because they knew where I was going every day. So that was that was kind of salt in the wounds, I thought. But the bottom line is it, it basically at the end of the day, it it didn't you know taking this information <clears throat> was no different than the government taking the information from your phones because they wanted to know where you're eating dinner every night or where you're playing volleyball or tennis or whatever. It was a warrantless search and the court saw it that way. And I don't think they'll ever get this overturned. I think this is a solid victory for us. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate that. Greg? Uh, sure. Uh, let me just make a few brief points about why um, when I got the phone call uh, from John about getting involved in this case as local counsel, why it was an easy decision to make uh, to take it on. Um, first, I'll give NCLA a little bit of a plug um, we're familiar with NCLA's work. Um, they do high quality work. They are known for what their issues are and um, their, uh, their issues that we find agreeable and important uh, to support, uh, like the one involved in this case. So that, that was a large part of it is because it was NCLA. And then obviously there's such a visceral uh, uh, reaction to, as, as, as Captain Walburn noted, to the, the kinds of things the government was asking the, the charter fishing boats to do. Um, you know, I think Americans have largely internalized uh, a lot of the values embodied in the Fourth Amendment. And so when you, when you hear of something like that, I mean, obviously not everybody, fortunately, not everybody went to law school. Some people are just normal people and, um, and have a, and have a, a reaction a negative reaction uh, to hearing the kinds of things that were required here. Uh, so that that was really, if you'll pardon the expression, a hook um, that uh, that got me interested in getting my firm involved in this. And the last point is, and and of course, Captain Walburn uh, touched on this too. Although he's in a different part of the Gulf, uh, Kate and I are sitting here in New Orleans, and you know, um, recreational fishing is an enormous part of our culture. Um, and I'd, I'd like to sort of ask my colleague, Kate Clark, to say a word about that. Um, I, I should say that she is actually quite a Fisher person herself and has a photograph of herself in her office holding a fish that's bigger than she is. So Kate, if you could just sort of uh, touch on uh, fishing and the local culture, which explains why we were interested in getting involved. Uh, sure, can you hear me okay? Yes. 
Um, so from my experience, I've been fishing my entire life. And when Greg asked me to be involved in this case, it was very near and dear to my heart because I've gone charter fishing multiple times a year since I was probably three years old. And the ability to you know, go fishing is a huge part of our culture here in Louisiana and the South more broadly. And, you know, this was a final rule that, in my opinion, which I believe Captain Walburn will confirm, posed to destroy the industry because the costs were so high for these devices, not just the Fourth Amendment costs, but also just the actual cost. So, and what really bothered me about this case and the situation is that you couldn't even take your family fishing on your own boat and not get tracked. And to me, that just violates you know, everything that we know about our right to just exist in the world without being monitored by the government. And so, yeah, this case was very near and dear to me. And um, I was very happy when Greg asked if I would help out. By the way, that's the picture. You can see the picture uh, uh, of her with the fish right there in her office. So um, I, I think that um, so you you guys are in New Orleans. This this was the Gulf. It covers basically from the from the uh, western border of Florida, Key West, all the way to Texas. Um, but Alan, you ha you have a view that part of the reason they do this is to actually get people to stop fishing, being charter boat captains. Well, they, they do everything they can to throw up roadblocks for us. They keep passing rules and regulations that are, you know, not necessarily based on scientific fact, but on bureaucratic whims. Um, this this issue would have been a death knell for a lot of fishermen because. You have to have this device on your boat and you have to pay the cost of the device and you have to pay the tracking fees every month. A lot of a lot of the charter fishermen in this country, especially in the Southeast, are what we call part-time fishermen. They'll have a, a full-time job Monday through Friday and then they'll, they'll use their boats to take people out for hire on the weekends. And having to buy these expensive devices and pay the $75 a month or more for the, for the um, service charges and stuff would have just caused them to say it's not worth the effort and they would have dropped out I think and yeah. um, all I can say to a layman is how would you like it if the government required you to put a tracking device on your automobile because you're using federal highways they want to know where you're going every time you leave your house you have to tell them where you're going and when you're going to get back and where you're going and the purpose of your trip when you're leaving your house that's what they were doing to us we had to hail out to them every morning tell them where we're going, what time we were expected to return, and the purpose of us leaving the dock. If I wanted to slip out and take my paramour or something on a midnight cruise, I had to call them and tell them I'm going. And, you know, what am I supposed to say? We're just going out to count the stars? It just, it was just a huge intrusion into the privacy of everybody that owned a charter boat. And, um, and have you had, they couldn't justify the reason. Have you have had heard any reaction, you know, you and uh, uh, the other folks who actually stepped up and were the class representatives here obviously um, have the views you've just expressed. Have you heard from anybody after the case was decided about uh, what they think? Almost everybody uniformly was, was in agreement with us in the industry. Now, I will say this, that Noah's famous for doing what I call divide and conquer. When they want to pass something or enact something that's um, not popular, they'll go to a certain segment of the population, or, excuse me, of the user group and cut them some, some breaks to get their support. And they did that up in the Northern Gulf. They gave the Northern Gulf fishermen an extra, I don't remember how many days it was, of, of open season for red snapper for those guys up there. Red snapper is a huge fishery for the Northern Gulf, and they ex expanded the fishery, fishing up there for red snapper during their season because they have such a short season those guys jumped all over it and there was a there was a charter boat group similar to the national association of charter boat operators not as big but they they did support it to some degree or another because they were being given fishing days that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise but beyond that like i said just put it in simple terms how would you like to have a tracking device on your car and have to explain the use of your car every time you got in it cranked it up that's that's 
put it boiled out and then have to pay for that on top of everything. It's egregious and it's not American, it's not unconstitutional. Greg, final words. I'll open up for questions if there are any, but why don't you guys tell me if you got any other thoughts about uh, anything the anyone else has said. Observe is that, um, you know, without getting too deep in the weeds, um, the statement that the court made in handing down this decision could not have been uh, stronger in its criticism of what the government did here. Um, they, uh, they found what the government did to have been uh, illegal, essentially, on two different grounds. They said you're, you, what you did was, was illegal for this reason, and it was also illegal for this reason. And that's before we get to the Fourth Amendment and the constitutional values. Um, so it was quite a quite a trip to the woodshed um, for the government, and quite quite a strong signal um, to the government more broadly uh, that you need to be a lot more careful um, crossing your crossing your T's and dotting your I's going forward. If I could expand on that, I think the reason the courts gave us such a strong verdict is because the lawyering on our side was just unbelievably good. The arguments that we raised were indispensable by no and took pleading that we sent up and I don't know what that judge is smoking and all their crap with this opinion. I, I think we'll be hard pressed to try to do anything else anytime soon with something like this. Kate, any final thoughts before I go to questions? Oh, um, I was just going to echo what Greg said that, you know, I'm also encouraged that I think that this ruling, it was such a strong rebuke of the government's actions here, but I think it'll have more far reaching consequences, including the fact that, you know, one of the issues was whether the government had adequately considered the privacy interest of the people involved here. And what the Fifth Circuit said was basically privacy and security are not the same. You didn't consider it. And I think that that has uh, a lasting effect in future cases that says you can't hide your hand, your head in the sand about this, and you can't say keeping data secure is sufficient. So that's my kind of takeaway as well about future effects. All right, I have a question here. Um, what is the connection between this case and Loper Bright? In Loper Bright, the government put observers on fishing boats and made the fishermen pay for it. It's the Chevron case. The Chevron analysis and the AP analysis in the two cases are similar. Um, and I, they add, is the case over? Will, um, will the N N M F National Marine Fishery Service simply reissue a substantially similar surveillance rule? Well, I'll just answer the reason... We think that Loper Bright, we have a, NCLA has a case that's tracking Loper Bright, same regulation. Um, and um, that case is that they did put monitors on the boat. The law was clear you could put living monitors on the boat, but not who paid for them. And I think it's similar in that case because just as here that the Magnuson-Stevenson Act, which is what we're talking about, was silent on whether you could put these things on the boat. And the court, the Fifth Circuit also made another important finding that this question reminds me of, that the Magnuson stevenson Act allows the uh, agencies to require, make requirements for devices that are used to support the Magnuson stevenson Act. But they said, wait a second, this tracking doesn't let you count fish. It doesn't let you monitor the waters. It doesn't, all it does is tell you where a person is, which doesn't serve the purposes of the Magnuson stevenson Act. So this device that they required them to build was not even, I mean, purchase was not even a device under the Magnuson Stevenson Act. And I think that we'll, we'll see some sites to that decision as well. So I think that the Loper Bright case is similar to this in that there is silence in the statute. And when there's silence, does the agency get to do what it, what it wants? Now, in our case, the time for a petition to the Supreme Court by the government in Mexican Gulf, uh, it doesn't run till next week. Uh, but I suspect from their actions so far that they will not appeal it. And I don't think, I think that the um, agencies could make a new rule having to do with counting fish or something like that, but they're not allowed to follow you around. I don't think that's going to change. 
Um, anyone else have other thoughts on that? Um, John, if I could just expand on what you said about the fish counting and the, the, the VMS system. <clears throat> the VMS system, the only accurate thing about it is it tracks the boat. The fish data collection is manually uploaded by the captain and it could be accidentally uploaded incorrectly, it could be deliberately uploaded incorrectly, or it could be accurately uploaded. But there was no there was no compelling reason to do this other than to track the physical location of our boats. We were giving them exactly the same information on a paper logbook form as they were getting with the electronic logbook. It all had to be manually uploaded and you had to depend on the captain's honesty to get accurate data. All right, I have another question here, unless anyone wants to follow up on that. Okay. Um, I've already answered, is, are they going to file a cert um, petition? I don't believe they will. Um, and I, so I think it's going to stick. Um, no one's told me that, but the way they're acting, I just don't think so. Um, and I'm trying to go down here and see this next question. Um, I think I've asked, someone asked, well, why'd they do it? Why did the agency do this if it didn't let them count? What was in it for them? I don't know. I'm going to throw that out to you people. I don't know the answer to that. My theory is some lobbyist got next to a bureaucrat and said, hey, here's something we can do to make your job easier. Instead of having to download these paper logbook forms, we can put these tracking devices on it. They'll upload everything right into your computer, and so it'll save manpower. That's my theory, and I think it's accurate. Um, I, I'd like to comment on that. Um, it, it, it certainly, uh, in, in the court below, there was, um, the, the, the court below uh, uh, put together whatever interests the government may have in um, uh, uh, commercial fishing with recreational fiction, fishing. I mean, they, they treated it as one and the same thing. I don't think anybody uh, on our side, disputes that the government has uh, an interest in um, fish stocks, maintaining good fish stocks uh, in our waters. Uh, and, and in order to do that, they really probably need to keep a commercial fishing volume involved. Um, here, of course, I mean, I, I guess the point needs to be made that the volume of fish um, that taken by recreational fishing and particularly by uh, charter boat fishing is a lot is, is you know is just magnitudes multiples smaller it's 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 a it, it's it's a it, it's scarcely uh you know get, gets on the radar one or two percent i think yeah it's like one or two percent of what commercial fishing is so to the extent if you will there's a fig leaf of government interest to justify what they did. Um, the only uh, rationale I'm aware of that was ever articulated was, was keeping an eye on, on fish populations. And as the court said, it doesn't do that. Right. So, um, anything, Kate? Um, I was just, the way I've kind of thought about it, because I too, I'm kind of a, a cynic like Captain Walburn, where I just figured maybe somebody who sold these devices thought, well, this would be great. We'll require them now. Um, but that's just, I don't have any facts to back that up. Um, yeah, I'll echo what Greg said again. But then I want to add that to me, I saw this as just a broader play by the government to continue to normalize being monitored by the government. And to me, they were trying to hide behind the APA and Chevron deference to get away with it, and they did not. And, and that's how I felt, is just this ever-growing data creep by the government. Um, so whether there was actually a real reason based in protecting fish stocks for this information, I didn't see it, but you know that's what they said. So, All right, I have one final... There was no difference in the data collection from the electronic monitoring or the previous paper book monitoring. It was only as good as the captains that were uploading it. The same information was going to know, same identical information. So um, 
last question, I think that because I, I think we've answered the others. Will this decision have an impact on future agency rulemaking? Looking specifically at the necessary and appropriate language that is frequently used. Um, and will this has a, a negative environmental impact on fish? Well, I think we've answered that. It, it won't because this wasn't really about fish counting. Um, uh, it, as as we've, as we've said, but necessary and appropriate that is the final point I didn't make in my opening, but there has been a dis the, the Fifth Circuit's, I guess I made it a little bit, but the Fifth Circuit's, um, there's statutory language in many statutes that's the same that says, yeah, uh, the agency shall have the ability to um, make regulations necessary and appropriate to serve the purposes of this of, of this statute. Well, what does that mean? Does that give them carte blanche to do what they want? Fifth Circuit says, no, that's a limiting. It, it has to be necessary and appropriate to something in the statute. Does it not necessary and appropriate hanging in the air? And necessary and appropriate includes costs. And that is going to come back again and again, I think, in the future. And I think that's important. And I don't see any other questions. I'm just going to ask my friend Ruslan here to make sure I'm not missing anything, OK? So we're gonna we're gonna close out, and I'll just give everyone final thoughts. I've said my final thoughts. I do think that it's gonna be cited quite a bit, and I think it's gonna be even cited to the Supreme Court shortly. I've got nothing to add to that. Okay. Only thing I have to add to it is thank you for a great job of lawyering <clears throat> and the charter fishing industry and the boating population in general. Greatly appreciate it. <clears throat> Excuse me for everything you guys did for us. We greatly appreciate it. Good job. Welcome, Alan. Thanks. Kate, anything? Oh, I was just going to actually in reverse thank Captain Walburn for making the initial call to call you and raise this issue. And, you know, it's not nothing to serve as a class representative. So, and drive this forward, really. Yeah. Well, well, let me give you just a little bit of inside scoop on this. This little inside baseball. The reason he, he took my case is because he wanted to have a vacation in Naples, Florida. <laughs> my, that was my deep, dark secret. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. you so very much, all of you.